again yeah welcome to this uh, session for community presentation and uh, our first speaker uh, would be silvio and he would be talking about open citations so over to you silvio thank you so let me just share my screen and my presentation i hope you can see the presentation right now yes yes absolutely. okay great okay thank you so um Hello, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Silvio Peroni. I'm a professor at the University of Bologna and director of Open Citation. And I will introduce you uh, something about what we are doing in terms of uh, Open Citations for what concerns as assessment. So first of all, uh, we have heard a lot of times talking about the reproducibility crisis in the past years. We know that this crisis affects science, but also not only science, but also methods that we use to assess science itself. It is not a critic that is only based to the recipes, so the metrics themselves that are used in research assessment, but also um, the point is also the lack of transparency of the ingredients used for computing these uh, metrics that are the data. So the data that we use to compute all this stuff. Um, and this has been also highlighted by several different documents released in the past years that claim to have and to follow open science practices also for research assessment exercise claiming that in particular data must be uh, made available uh, for free in the public domain in order to foster open transparent and simple uh, research assessment exercises um, I don't know if you notice it, but paywall and closed citation data doesn't comply at all with this idea of uh, having a reproducible research and assessment exercise. Actually, they are a real threat to transparency, the replicability, and verifiability of research assessment exercise. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to push forward uh, on that area. Open citation is a community guided open infrastructure that is uh, and dealing with the availability, to making available open bibliographic citation data in order to be used in a research assessment exercise, among the other things, in order to make these exercises reproducible and the metrics that are used. Among the things that we are we make available, there are a lot of data sets and collections. The main one are called open citation indexes, in particular Koki. All the data there are available in CC0, so you can reuse them for any purposes, including, of course, research assessment exercise, and you can access this data by means of uh, services, REST API, Sparkle endpoints, but also to download them uh, in mass uh, by downloading the entire dump. Uh, currently, we make in the main index that is called COCI, the Open Citation Index of ProSref Open DOI to DOI citations, we, may, we make available uh, more than 1.23 um, billion citations there, including citations coming from Elsevier and the American Chemical Society that have recently released their uh, reference list in Crossref as open material. And the point here is that all the things, that all the entities that we, we have there are single citations. So we represent the citation as a first class data entity enriched with several metadata that allow basically to do interesting operation on the citation itself. So the citation declare what is the citing entity, the cited entity, what is the citation creation date, and what is the time span between the publication dates of the citing and cited entity. Um, we follow uh, strictly the um, several principles related to and guidelines related to open sciences, open science, in particular, the UNESCO principle of open science the uh, principle uh, of uh, open scholarly infrastructures uh, as we are an open scholarly infrastructure the fair principle where data uh, should be uh, findable accessible interoperable and reusable and the initiative for open citation i4oc principles where citation data should be structured separable and open and uh, the idea is to be compliant with all this value in order to this is our main priority to keep all we offer services, software, data, always available for free in the open without, without charge. So you can reuse our services and, and data for any purpose for fostering basically maximum reuse in different activity, including the research assessment exercises. We have been selected in 2019 by SCOS since SCOS thought that we align very well with open science goals 
and we offer an inno innovative service that can be a game changer in challenging existing proprietary, proprietary um, citation services. And in addition to collaborating with SCOS uh, infrastructure, we are also collaborating with open air uh, and the infrastructure related to, to, to it in order to offer additional services to be included in the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, open Science Cloud. Different way to help. Uh, we have two different uh, programs to help us. Membership program with rights for members in the governance of the infrastructure and also a simple donation program. There are all the information available in the website linked at this slide. And that's all. Basically, uh, this is a very quick presentation about open citations. So please support open, open citations. We can all together make different uh, supporting us means basically su to support open science practices and guidelines. And that's yep. basically all. Thank you all. Thank you, Silvio. Yeah. Uh, probably Christian. Hi, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes. uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think my evil plan worked out. Uh, Silvio did a lot of uh, introduction to uh, my presentation that I can now skip. Uh, in short, um, uh, something just to piggyback on what Silvio said, citation indexes, the classical citation indexes focus on exclusivity. So uh, these, um, these journals that are scholar-led, small niche journals, or um, all journals that are not supported by uh, big publishers or uh, publishing professionals are usually excluded from citation indexes and citation databases. And um, say to, uh, journals from big publishers usually have an edge because uh, there is more knowledge about how to get into these citation um, indexes. And uh, authors want to be indexed uh, because sometimes their um, career relies on being indexed in citation indexes. Um, there's a solution that was just uh, presented. So it's the Open Citation Initiative with all uh, its um, indexes and activities. And um, our idea is that uh, the dissemination of open research information will foster visibility and connectivity of research output. Um, and we think that citation metadata is the key for connecting these publications and to make them more visible. Um, and we see uh, the open citations initiative as a um, chance to get a more diverse scholarly research information commons to uh, include uh, other journals, other subjects, other languages that are currently excluded from all these citation uh, indexes. So open citations has ensured a potential for increased diversity or bibliodiversity as it's sometimes called. Um, currently there are around 25,000 journals that are hosted with uh, the open source software, open journal systems. Um, it was just presented at the Open Publishing Fest, I think, a few weeks ago, that there are really 25,000 journals that is massive, and a lot of these journals are not in, um, in Scopus Web of Science dimensions, and they are not in um, the Open Citations Index, like Koki or something. Uh, so uh, we wanted to make contributing to the Citation Commons easier for them because a lot of these journals are really challenged by the technique and the metadata standards and so on. So we are working in a um, project funded by our Ministry of Science um, on an OJS plugin that aims at extracting um, metadata, citation metadata from the uh, manuscripts or from the galleys from open journal systems. We want uh, to enrich these reverence, uh, references and we want to use several methods. So automatic extraction of extraction of references text fields in OJS. We want to extract from the manuscripts or the galleys and uh, we will try to use external service for more accurately extracting and disambiguating references uh, to provide them to Koki and so on and to uh, wiki side wiki data to several open data uh, commonses, commons. And um, uh, yeah, and we want to make this available as an open source um, plugin for OJS. And um, 
this is not the only thing that we want to do. We want to enrich the metadata in other ways too. We are going for geolocations in the next year, but uh, citations is the first step. So if you want to join our adventure, um, here you have some links. I already published the slides. I will put it in the uh, Zoom chat and you are very welcome to join the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Uh... Uh, so, uh, Maike, probably uh, you'd want to go next? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Let me yeah. share my screen. Sure. Can you see this? Yes. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maike de Jong. I work at the Netherlands eScience Center as the project lead for the research software directory, among other things. Um, and I'll jump right in by saying that research software is crucial for today's research, whether it's algorithms for big data processing, um, software to operate scientific uh, tools or instruments, predictive modeling, for example, uh, for climate change. Research software is essential in pushing the boundaries of what's possible in science. So the mission of the eScience Center where I work is to empower researchers across all disciplines in the Netherlands through innovative software, uh, research software. And one of the main things we do is collaboratively design software for research in collaboration with researchers via uh, our own uh, project calls and other projects. So, um, so our main research output is software. And to show, um, all this software that we produce to the outside world, we uh, developed the research software directory. This is a content management system for research software, and it showcases software as a research output. The system is open source, and there's a current prototype running at software.esciencecenter.nl, so we already use it ourselves. Um, on the right, you can see uh, what the front page looks like. So it's really like a gallery of software packages. And when you click on one of those packages, you go to a software page. Uh, this is an example uh, of the top of the page. So what it shows, um, for example, is uh, human understandable information in the form of text. For example, what is the software for? Uh, what problem does it solve? And it gives more context about, uh, for example, the research domain. It also provides uh, software citation information. And it was actually really great to see so much attention for this topic in this conference. Um, it, uh, you can get citation information for a specific version, uh, you get a DOI citation file. So it really promotes reuse and uh, repro reproducibility as well. It also gives um, quite a bit of academic context um, and it shows the impact of the software. For example, uh, it, it links to uh, any uh, associated papers, presentations, blogs, videos, etc. Uh, it shows you the projects um, in which it has been developed or reused, and also the people who contributed to the software. So, in short, uh, we think the research software directory increases discoverability and reuse of research software. It promotes software citation. And by doing these things, it also really improves the recognition of the work of uh, scientists who uh, develop software and research software engineers. So we really want to share this tool with the research community because for us, it's a really great tool. Um, and at the moment, we're developing uh, this tool as a service. So it's already available open source. Uh, but we hope to finish uh, the as a service product uh, at the end of 2022. So we're develop developing it for the wider com user community. Um, during this phase, sorry, uh, we're gathering lots of stakeholder uh, input. We will organize, for example, online testing events. So stay tuned uh, if you are interested in the service, uh, you, you could uh, contribute to this as well. And we're collaborating with uh, several leading Dutch research organizations, for example, Amsterdam UMC, uh, University of Leiden, University of Utrecht, 
uh, to start implementing this service uh, at their organizations. I'll finish with leaving some links um, to uh, stay in touch with us and to follow what's happening and by thanking the team. Um, I'll put the slides on Zenodo and if you have any questions, you can also find me on uh, Slack of this community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikey. Uh, uh, going next, uh, uh, Gail, probably uh, you'd want to share the screen. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you, just sharing my screen. Okay, sorry, going back to the first slide would be better. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here today to introduce Project Jasper, uh, which is an initiative uh, led by the Directory of Open Access Journals and to which um, the ISSN International Centers uh, actually cooperates. I'm Gail Biquet, I'm the director of the ISSN International Center based in Paris, France. So, uh, what is uh, Jasper? Uh, it's a, 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 um, a tool um, which actually will help journals, open access journals, non-APC journals, uh, to find a route uh, to um, actually benefit from long-term preservation. Uh, what are uh, the, the funding partners of Jasper? Uh, as you can see, and I've already mentioned it, uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals, uh, Internet Archive, Clocks, um, Public Knowledge Project, and the ISSN International Center. So, um, for journals actually listed or, or registered with the Directory of Open Access Journals, what we want to do is to uh, um, guide them towards um, organization or give them some guidance to use the services provided by uh, organizations and uh, archiving agencies such as uh, PKP Private Network, PKPPN, and as you may know, and OJS has already been mentioned uh, in this um, present in in this session, um, the titles using Open Journal System can actually benefit from uh, preservation services offered by PKP, and uh, PKP is actually a, an organization uh, led or managed by. Uh, US and, and uh, Canadian um, academic libraries. The second archiving option uh, is uh, provided by CLOCKS, uh, which is based in, in the US. Uh, this option will be available to or made available to titles registered in, in the OIJ that can provide uh, metadata and, and content and detailed content. Um, and they will be actually um, led to uh, clocks archiving agencies for, uh, for long-term preservation. And for journals, uh, which cannot provide any detailed metadata, the idea is to have them uh, uh, harvested um, by Internet Archive. And last but not least, actually, um, the ISSN IC and uh, more specifically Keeper's Registry uh, will be the place where uh, the general public, since it's a, a free service, uh, will find information about the global archiving um, process and uh, which titles, which journals are actually archived where. Where do we stand now uh, as of December 2021 um, with Jasper? Tests will be completed soon with uh, six pilot journals. Um, we, we are also currently building gateways uh, between DOAJ and Internet Archive and, and Clocks. And um, DOIJ is actually expanding its technical facilities to accommodate um, uh, journals data. Um, regarding uh, PKP and OJS, um, the documentation informing journals editors about uh, how to use the archiving plugin um, provided with uh, OJS has, uh, has been updated and is available online. Um, you can find more information on Keeper's Registry, where actually uh, these um, archiving agencies report their data. And um, 
one more thing about Kibbe's registry, you can also find uh, statistics about our contributing archiving agencies. And as you can see here on, on, on this slide, there is still work to do because uh, in our service road, the Directory of Open Access Scholarly Journals, we register or we, we, we track or identify a bit more than 50,000 uh, open access journals. And uh, within Keeper's Registry, there are only 10, about approximately 10,000 which are uh, preserved. So there is more to do. And uh, beyond Jasper, I just want to, to say that this initiative will be expanded. The idea is to include more journals, of course, and more archiving agencies. And uh, our, our, well, this project is actually uh, relevant to SDGs uh, 11 and, and 17, uh, 11 being uh, sustainable cities and communities, and um, SDG 17 being strengthen the means uh, of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. So keep posted. Um, I will post my slides to start with. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, I guess there are some Q&A um, uh, questions on the Q&A. Uh, let me know if you can check that. And uh, next I would be um, asking uh, Esther uh, to uh, share. Slides, yeah. Thank you. And I'll be introducing to you the Turing Way, which is a sustainable and inclusive solution to sharing best practices. Uh, so I posted a link in the chat, so hopefully you can follow the slides along yourself. Um, but my name is Esther Plump. I'm a core contributor for the Turing Way. Uh, recently upgraded to project member. And I'm also a data steward at uh, the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. So if you have any questions about these two topics, uh, projects, uh, then let me know through email or I'm on the uh, Slack channel or on Twitter. So what is the Turing Way? Uh, the Turing Way is an open source community driven guide to reproducible, ethical, inclusive and collaborative data science. And because that is a very long sentence, I would like to split that up in four components. Uh, the Turing Way is a book, it's a community, it's an open source project, and we foster a culture of collaboration throughout uh, all these components. Uh, so first to start, it's a book. And if you follow the links in the slides or just Google the Turing Way, you will end up in uh, on a website where the book is openly available. And this is the landing page. And what you can see is that we have several guides. So the Turing Way started as a guide for reproducible research, but we now also have a guide for project design, communication, collaboration, ethical research, and a community handbook if you're interested in trying to uh, find out more about our community or if you would like to set up your own community. Uh, so all that information is available and I think uh, interesting for anyone interested in data science. There should be something in the book for you. Uh, and if not, you can contribute because the Turing Way is an open source project. And what that means is that anyone can freely read, reuse, distribute, modify, and develop any content uh, that the Turing Way has. And the project is also not belonging to a single person, but it belongs to the Turing Way community. And it's really, uh, facilitating collaboration. It's also built on open source infrastructure. Uh, so we're using Git, JupyterBook, Binder, and Netlify. And if you uh, go to our GitHub repository, which is where most of the contributions uh, to the Turing Way take place, uh, you'll uh, see the README file, uh, which is uh, screenshotted in this slide. And there you can find out more information about where to go uh, to contribute and how to uh, be a part of the community. Because uh, yeah, the Turing Way is also a community and none of the resources and materials would be available online uh, without our fantastic community. Uh, so thanks very much to these 300 users uh, and contributors that have contributed to the Turing Way. 
And uh, what you can do to become a part of the community uh, and what is in it for you is basically we're a space where you can connect with others uh, with similar interests. You can learn a new skill. So for example, I really learned how to work with GitHub. Uh, so there's no need to already be uh, skilled in that. You can learn that through the Turing way. You can also share your skills. You can discuss ideas and collaborate with others on them. Uh, you can mentor other people's contribution. Uh, or like I am doing today, you can represent the community uh, in conferences and spreading the word. So any contribution is really valuable, even if you just see a broken link, uh, please do let us know so that we or you can fix that. Um, how you can participate in the community, if you would like to learn more, we have online uh, events, uh, collaboration cafes, and community co-workings are more co-working call sessions where you can um, work on something that you'd like to contribute or just discuss things. And uh, this Friday, December 10th, we have a fireside chat on shared concerns in open research community. Uh, and that is something which I think is relevant to people attending this conference. So we would love to see you there. And for now, I would like to thank uh, Kirsty Whitaker, Malvika Sharon, and the entire Turing Way community, and also provide you with some useful links to the book itself, our Twitter accounts, uh, a monthly newsletter. And if there's anything uh, that you take away from this talk, I hope it's actually the very nice images by Scriberia that are all available online on a CC BY uh, license. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, going on to the next speaker, Judith, you'd want to uh, share your screen? Yeah. Yep, I'm going to do that right now. Share screen. OK, so I can you see that OK? Yeah, OK. So this presentation is introducing the work of the COPIN project, specifically work package two, um, which is called um, the Open Book Collective. Um, it's called Open Access Monograph Beyond the BPC. And BPC, as some of you will know, stands for Book Processing Charge. Book processing charges are paid by authors and institutions to open access publishers in order to make their book open access. The problem with this model, although it can be useful at times, is that it tends to entrench inequalities that are already in global academia, such as privileging research by wealthier institutions and universities, especially those in the global north. So the Open Book Collective is one of our proposed solutions to this problem. And the OBC, or Open Book Collective, is an output of the COPIN project. COPIN stands for Community-Led Open Publication Infrastructures for Monographs. And you can see the links um, to our PubPub, our Twitter, and our website there, where you'll find open access, obviously, all the work that we have done so far and all the outputs that we've made from the different work packages. Copen is an international collaboration bringing together researchers, universities, libraries, OA book publishers, and infrastructure providers. It was initially a three-year project funded from 2019 to 2022, but we are securing a no-cost extension into 2023 at the moment. Um, it has been funded by Research England, Arcadia, and our consortium partners. And the purpose of this is to build, maintain, uh, build and maintain the infrastructures that are required to promote, sustain, and distribute open access book publishing in academia. Of course, the, the publication structures for OA books are rather lagging behind those for journals. They tend to be more fragmented. Um, the landscape makes it difficult for librarians to navigate with schemes to support, and also publishers tend to lack the distribution channels to get OA books. Small and medium publishers tend to lack the established distribution channels to get OA books into libraries. If you follow that link from the slides from the Zenodo, you'll learn more about um, OBC as the project of Work Package 2 in comparison to what the other work packages are doing. So what we're doing 
is creating a revenue and management platform for libraries and other institutional subscribers to support the work of small to medium away book publishers of their choosing. And the current design specs for this platform include a membership builder for libraries to choose the flexible subscription packages, the functionality to sign up at different levels, a library um, viewport management dashboard, a viewport for initiatives, um, and the integration of metadata through TOTE. TOTE is a project that you can, again, investigate by following the link in the slide that ingests the metadata cat ingests the catalogs of OA publishers and produces maximally readable metadata, making it easily searchable by a variety of systems. So the payment flow we imagine is that the customer will sign up um, to subscribe to a package of their choosing via a UK or US payment processor through the OBC to their chosen initiative. So on this slide here, you can see a bit more of a detailed model as to how the platform will work. Scholar-led is the consortium of open access publishers which are piloting this team. Um, those are some of their logos. They, have, they are now expanding and taking on new members and some of our more recent members include African Minds um, and Media Studies Press, um, Punkton Books and Mattering Press uh, um, and Open Book Publishers are amongst the founding members of Scholar-led. So, as you can see there, um, the publishers and infrastructure providers input clear and consistent information on their packages and values into the OBC platform. Um, libraries input their membership fees, consistent metadata and information on local relevance of initiatives comes out, and it goes to consortia membership organizations such as GISC and Lyrasis. I'll just scroll down a little bit more. Um, now, our governance of the platform naturally reflects our communal values and a dedication to transparency and equity. We imagine at the moment, this diagram is by Eileen Joy, um, the manager of Punk and Books, one of our founding publishers, that the Open Book Collective is comprised of publishers, infrastructure providers, publisher collectives, and library and organizations. Um, so the user's interface through a web platform, a management team, and above the platform sits the administrative committee, which manages the day-to-day -day running um, of the platform, and above which sits the board of trustees, which is devoted to ensuring the values established by um, the project at the outset are maintained in policy into the future such as non-incorporation and not forcing publishers to level, to, to create a network that is scalable rather than forcing individual publishers to scale beyond what they are um, ready for. If you follow that link, you'll, see, you'll learn more about our governance structures and the processes uh, by which did, we write. Uh, uh, we have to uh, compute uh, quickly, yeah. Okay. That's the end anyway. I just want to say as well, if you want to connect with us and get involved, just follow any of the links of the, on the last slide, which specifies who you'll need to speak to, and you can download this from the Zenodo. Thank you, Judith. Uh, probably uh, next, we, our next speaker is Maya. Uh, would you like to share your slides? Uh, uh, you are muted. Great, is everyone able to see my slides now? Um, wonderful, I am excited to be here today to actually go in a slightly different direction uh, than these really broadly applicable and fascinating projects that have been presented so far. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna be zooming us into the space of clinical trials and a specific narrow solution that can improve science discoverability for trial evidence. Um, and also quickly, I'm based at the Quest Center for Responsible Research, which is in the Berlin Institute of Health at the Charité University Medical Center. So hence working on biomedical research specifically. So the issue at hand is that evidence synthesizers and systematic reviewers need comprehensive clinical trial evidence in order to make 
clinical guidance and health policy. And that, that comprehensive evidence includes a trial registration. So that's a uh, pre-specified study design in a World Health Organization or WHO approved registry prior to the study beginning. And then after the study's completion is a peer reviewed journal article, uh, regardless of the directionality of findings. And while creation of these two types of evidence is a first step, it's also crucial that they're actually discoverable. And that means that the registration and publication should actually be linked, which actually makes the both most more findable and more easily findable because you can find one via the other. And this linking is indeed recommended by the WHO, by the CONSORT trial reporting guidelines, by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors or ICMJE. And it's pretty easy to do. Um, researchers can do this by including the trial registration number in the publication, and that should be in both the abstract of the publication and the full text, and also by including the DOI of the publication in the registration following publication of the, the study results. And compared to the whole amount of work that goes into conducting a clinical trial, this step is, is really quite easy um, and, and offers a huge gain for, for science discoverability. So the question that my research group was wondering is what is actually happening? How many trials are, are well connected? And so along with Benjamin Gregory Carlisle and Daniel Streich, we investigated a sample of 2000 trials that were conducted at German university medical centers and for which we had a comprehensive body of their registrations and matched results publications. And then we used automated strategies to examine these links. I won't go into those methods anymore, but you can see the preprint at that DOI with the slides up on the Zenodo. Um, in terms of our findings, in brief, we found that the trial evidence wasn't being sufficiently linked. And just to put some numbers behind that, 50% of registrations did not have the DOI to the publication, and 75% of publications did not have the registration number in both the abstract as well as in the full text. And even more severe was that 17% of the trials had absolutely no links. You could not connect the registration and the, the publication without extensive manual searches. And that means a burden to researchers and the risk that they won't even be found and the evidence would go missing. So the good news is that there's quite a bit of action that can be taken across stakeholder groups um, to improve this. And that's why I'm excited to be presenting it to this community of scholarly communicators and hopefully meet some folks here who can help move this forward. Now, first off, researchers can simply put their ideas in their papers, of course, and institutions can help encourage that, for example, through the ethics review process or follow up from the clinical trials office. But journals and publishers can also play a role. So one thing is they can check for trial IDs during the peer review process um, or during the pre-peer review process. And they can also ask researchers to provide this, this ID as metadata. And this is wonderful that we're seeing this in more and more journals as well as preprint servers and wanna keep seeing this. Um, and then journals can actually take this metadata and provide it to bibliographic databases like Crossref, and I know we'll be hearing from Crossref shortly, as well as PubMed, and that'll help improve findability. Now, what can bibliographic databases do? Uh, well, and I'm going to talk uh, specifically about PubMed just now, but PubMed has already a metadata field for trial ID, and that's either sourced from the data provided by publishers, or it's extracted by manual reviewers at the National Library of Medicine from the publication abstract or full text. However, we found that 50% of these IDs were missing. So they were not extracted and not included in the metadata. And so we think that there, there might be space for improvement here. And there would be a few different options. One would be integrating some sort of automated approach like the one that we used in this project to do a first screening and then have a manual review to exclude false positives. And a lower tech um, approach would be some sort of retraining of officers, of, of the extractors. Uh, and then the no. final, yes. Uh, we need to conclude, yeah. Yeah, the final group that uh, can take action are the registries themselves um, who can either uh, include reminders to folks to use their IDs or source the IDs directly from PubMed so that researchers don't have to do that. 
Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone for your time and invite you please to reach out, especially if you're from any of the groups that um, I've mentioned and would be um, enthusiastic about moving forward with this goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Barbara. Barbara, are you here? Uh, could you please share your screen? I'm here, yes. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to share my screen now. Ah, yes, we can see it. Can everybody see my screen? <laughs> okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Barbara Lancho Barrantes. I'm leading the bibliography service at the University of Leeds. Today, I will be presenting a very preliminary results of my bibliometric research project, Innovative Means of Communicating Research Finding of Sustainable Development Goals. For the purpose of this analysis, I have, I have used Dimension Database to be able to analyze not only articles, but other means such as preprints, data sets, grants, etc. I have used a publication window of 10 years, from 2011 to 2020, to see the evolution and measure the scientific production in these codes, publication, articles, preprints, uh, in open access, for example, gold, green, hybrid, and also closed publication. The first table, you can see the research production in each goal. As you can see, the largest amount of publication are in affordable, clean energy, good health, and well being. And peace, justice, and a strong institution. However, the publication in climate action received the highest citation means. The number seven and three goals obtain the largest amount of data sets and grants. This figure is a comparison between the articles and preprints produced in the sustainable development goals. As you can see, in the 10 years, were produced more articles than preprints. But preprints played a key role in affordable and clean energy and peace, justice, and strong institutions. As you can observe, the production in sustainable development goals in articles and preprints do not present the same performance. The goals where uh, many articles were produced do not produce many preprints and Vice versa. Um, in this graph, uh, you can see, compare the citation means of articles and preprints produced in the goals. As you can see again, the impact of articles and preprints don't have the same distribution. The article which receive the highest impact are about climate action. Um, on the other hand, the preprints receiving the highest impact are about zero hunger. We could investigate further if there is a, an influence of specific countries in this contribution to these goals. Are countries of, this, uh, of the global south tackling this challenging? In this um, figure, we can observe the publication types of open access uh, filters, closed, open, and types of open, green, gold, hybrid, etc. The majority of publications produced about sustainable development goals <laughs> were closed. No freely available copy has been, uh, any copy has been identified in Dimension database. All publications which uh, are neither uh, gold, green, hybrid, nor brown. However, there are some open uh, production which exceed uh, close for example, in, go, uh, in good health and well-being, quality education and reduced inequalities. The main, well, the main con conclusion, this is very preliminary, this is a quite descriptive, uh, so I have to keep uh, investigating in this uh, um, theme, 
but the main result are the, the three sustainable development goals with the highest number of publications on affordable and clean energy, good health and well-being, peace, justice, and strong institutions. However, the ones with the highest impact, the citation means, are climate and action, life below water, and responsible consumption and production. Preprints have played an important role in the transmission of research results. However, more articles were produced uh, with a greater uh, uh, preprint. So the majority of closed publication are in, uh, in clean energy, good health and well-being, uh, peace, justice, and a strong institution. However, the open access publication exceeds the close in good health and well-being, quality education, and reduce inequality. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you for all your attention. So if anyone wants to collaborate with me in this project, please, please get, get in touch because I think it's quite interesting and it's a, a quite important topic for yeah, the yeah. society. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Martin. Uh, Martin? Uh, could you please share your uh, screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah, so um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening to everyone. And uh, it's been a really interesting session so far. I hope I can keep that up. Um, I'm a product manager at um, Crossref, uh, and I'm going to be talking about putting metadata to work. Um, and I'm going to start with the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And um, so these were written back in 2016, but we, we've kind of followed them for a while, but formally adopted, adopted them in November 2020. Um, if you're running an open scholarly infrastructure organization, I'd recommend that you look at them. They cover areas of governance, sustainability and insurance, which is you know, what happens if we, if we go violently off mission or if Crossref doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's a link to the, the POSI website there and uh, the blog as well. I put the full link to the blog, which is very long on the, um, um, in the chat. Uh, and there's a number of organizations that have adopted POSI. And one of the ad advantages for us is, is that it helps us when we partner with other organizations. If, they, if they've also adopted POSI, um, then it, it helps us to establish a working relationship. Um, and it's really the kind of foundations now of how we, we build our, our, our services and, and products and, and what we do to fulfill Crossref's mission. Um, so what do we do? We you probably are aware that Crossref collects DOIs. Uh, we also squeeze as much metadata as we can out of our members because that's a you know, service for the community. And we work very closely with the community. And we have a great uh, outreach and support team that uh, you know, do their work in, in many and, and various ways. And we provide products and services. Um, our main services are the, the APIs, um, where you can get all of our metadata. Um, they're free and public, uh, and you can, you can go and get as much metadata as you like from there. Um, we run some other services ourselves that I've listed here, but most importantly for us is that we, you know, the data that we have um, can uh, be a foundation for other people um, to run um, services. Um, and there are you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of, of those, and we're really happy to support those. So we collect DOIs, we collect metadata. We also try to uh, you know, make that metadata work a little bit by looking at connections between um, different uh, research outputs. So this is um, a, a graph a diagram um, so of something we call the research nexus. So in the middle is um, re our research outputs, and then around the outside are actions or connections that um, uh, relationships that can exist um, for, uh, for research outputs. Um, so in the middle there's things like you know, articles, books, conference papers, chapters, uh, but also things like data, software, and commentary, blogs, tweets, all these kind of things are, you know, part of the, the research um, environment these days. Um, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of actions that can happen from authoring, funding, uh, funding, publishing, um, things get modified, there's commentary and, and so on. And so we'd like to kind of uh, 
have a way to to make this available and one practical step we're looking at at the moment is a relationship api so the principle is that you query for a doi and then you get back the relationship to other items so that could be okay this this site's um, this uh, this item or is cited by another item um, maybe it cites a data set or um, uh, uh, it's a um, uh, uh, <coughs> Yeah, 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 you know, there's various various kinds of relationships in addition to kind of commentary that happens afterwards, tweets, annotations on hypothesis, Wikipedia citations, these kind of things. So it's a merging of what we've traditionally kept in our relationship metadata, um, and also what we you know what we have in event data, which is links to things outside of um, the crossref and persistent identifier world. Um, and bringing all those together to, to really give context to research. Um, to do this is not so straightforward and it requires a new data model for us. And we're, we're looking um, into this at the moment. Our developers have really thrown themselves into this project, which is great. We're aiming for a proof of concept by the end of this year. Um, and we'll be looking to move into production um, as soon as we can next year. There are quite still questions to answer. This is just a kind of an, an idea at the moment, but we hope to have something to show in 2021. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to have questions. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, probably we can have the questions over Q&A. And we have the last speaker from the, for the session, uh, Sarah. Um, could you probably share your screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um... Okay, hello everybody. I am Sara Monaco and I am the managing editor of Review Commons. So uh, today I will present Review Commons and describe what we do in the world of publishing. So uh, Review Commons is basically a platform that offers peer review of preprints and it was launched around two years ago by EMBO in uh, uh, collaboration with Asabio with the aim to accelerate access to peer reviewed uh, research with uh, uh, refereed preprints. Um, okay, so referee preprints are basically preprints that are posted together with their formal peer review. Uh, so they are an alternative products and it is exactly what we offer at Review Commons, but it is not only limited to that. So basically we try to create a bridge with the, uh, from, with the world of preprints and the world of traditional publishing. So we work uh, strictly in collaboration with BioArchive and MedArchive and also with a consortium of 17 journals belonging to different publishing groups that all agreed uh, to respect our policy to accept our reviews without starting the peer review process from uh, scratch. So basically in Review Commons, we perform a peer review of preprints and uh, uh, that can be uh, posted on BioArchive and MedArchive to create a refereed preprints, but they can also be later transferred to a journal. And the key feature of Review Commons is that if the first journal rejects the manuscript, it can be immediately um, resubmitted to another journal with the same set of reviews. And so uh, Review Commons has two different outcomes. One is the refereed preprint and the other one is the classical published paper. So as I said at the beginning, our main goal was to accelerate dissemination of peer reviewed research, both in terms of refereed preprints and in form of classical published papers. And we also want to eliminate the need of multiple rounds of peer review of the same manuscript at different journals. And this is achieved uh, because, we, um, because we have implemented a, um, a journal agnostic peer review process that makes our reviews portable across different journals. So let's see how the project is uh, uh, going so far. So this is a distribution of our accepted manuscripts across the journals of our consortium. And as you can see, all the 17 journals so far accepted manuscripts with our reviews, despite they are journals with different scopes and different uh, selection criteria. So this is uh, an indication that our journal agnostic peer review, even if, it's, if uh, it is not tailored to satisfy a specific journal standard, it is it still contains enough information from the side of the journals to make a decision upon a manuscript. And we got a very strong support from our community of authors about our journal agnostic peer review process. And as I said at the beginning, our main goal was to accelerate the time to 
uh, to publish and uh, and uh, and to accelerate the access to peer reviewed research in general so here we try to measure the time to publish in classical journals compared to uh, to review commons so uh, in purple you see data derived from the journals of embo press that we took as a, a, an example of like the classical system uh, and these were manuscripts that were either accepted or rejected by the journals of embo press so actually many of them went through multiple rounds of, of peer review. And you can see how the distribution looks like. In green, you see instead the data derived from Review Commons, and it is already clear that the time to publish uh, looks uh, consistently uh, shorter. And this is already a big achievement. But uh, I would also like to drag your attention on this red bar that refers to the time of posting refereed preprints that compared to the other two, it's much, much shorter so of course this is totally expected because uh, this time does not uh, involve the decision of a journal and the long process of publication but it is still important to notice how quickly a peer-reviewed article so solid science can reach the scientific community for free so we strongly believe in the value of refereed preprints and we want to support the use of this new mean of communicating science by our others and recognition of uh, refereed preprints by funders and institutions. So with this, I conclude and I give the word back to our moderator. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I think uh, we are just on time and uh, I guess the next session would be starting immediately. So thanks for joining here and probably let's just move on to the next session. And I would request uh, the audience to connect to our speakers over our Slack channel if you have further Q&A.